Well, hello, Thrive Church. My name is Lisa. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, whether it's your first time, whether it's your 10th time, your hunter time, we are so glad you're here. Whether you're joining us in person or online or in any of our campuses, New Britain, Terryville, or Torrington, we are just so excited that you are here. Um, as you walked in, you should have gotten a little communion cup. Uh, so if you didn't get it, you can go grab one now. And if you are at home, this gives you a chance to go find some juice and some bread or something laying around the house if you want to partake in that with us. Um, but before we do that, we are going to lift up our voices and just sing praises to our Lord and Savior, and we invite you to join.
So at this time, we're going to receive communion together. And what communion is was an act that Jesus did with his disciples during the Last Supper. He took the bread that was at the table, and he took the juice, and he said, remember my body that is broken for you, and remember my blood that is shed for you. And I love the part that he says to remember, because there's so many things in life that just sometimes blind us that fills our mind and our hearts, and we can't remember the goodness of God. We can't remember what he's done for us. But Jesus specifically said, when you take communion, remember me. Remember what he did dying on the cross, all the pain and suffering he went through, and remember his resurrection. 
Because when we remember that, the enemy has no power over us because we remind ourselves that we are living in victory. And I love how the psalmist says in um, Psalms 103, it says, may I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. And he says, he fills my life with good things. So I encourage you while you're taking communion today to remember the good things that he has done that fills your life. Remember all the ways he has made a way for you. Because when he died on the cross, he delivered you from all sin, from all sickness, from all temptation. He has given you power over this new life so that we may praise, that we may worship him knowing that he has overcome, knowing that he has given you that power. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The same that rose Christ from the dead now lives in you. So our hearts are filled with gratitude to him because he died on the cross. He went through all that pain and suffering for you because he loves you. There's nothing that he won't do for you. So remember that when we take this communion today, do not forget the good things he has done for you. Do not forget the way that he is making a path in your life. Do not forget that he has gone before you, that he walks with you now. These are the things that we do when we have communion, when we take this juice, when we take this bread, we remember his faithfulness to us and we fill our heart with praise. So God, today, right now, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your son, for his life that was given for us, that blood that was shed, his body, his perfect body that was broken. We thank you for not holding anything back for us. We thank you for that resurrection, that hope that we hold on to in this life. And God, we thank you for forgiveness and a new start and a new life. So we take this communion, we remember you and all of your goodness and all of the ways that you are faithful to us, the government that you keep with us. So God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You all may receive communion.
God, we are just so excited to sing of your praises. God, you are so good in every circumstance, in every season. And we are just so excited. We are excited to sing of all the things that you are doing, of how you are moving and how you are working. And we are so, so grateful. Let us not become tired or weary of gathering together and to sing of your praises and to sing of your goodness, to shout together of a king who is alive. We did communion today to remember your death, to remember the sacrifice that you did for us. You were brutally murdered for us and for our sins. But you didn't stay there. You rose from the dead. You rose from the grave so that we would have freedom, that we would not be bound to sin any longer. We would not be bound to depression or fear or anxiety or doubts or pain or sickness or cancer, that we will be free from it all in your name. So we come together, God, and we sing of your glorious name. We sing of the miracles that we know that you can and that you will do and that we will see here on earth. And we are just so grateful that you chose us. That you said, yes, these are my children. These are the ones that will see victory. Yes, they will have pain and they will have sorrow, but they will rise with me again. That they will have everlasting life in my name. And for that, God, we thank you. So we'll continue to sing of your praises. We'll continue to sing of your goodness. And we thank you for choosing us time and time again. I pray all this in your glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so glad to have you here with us today. My name is Judah, and I'm lead pastor here at Thrive. And we are in a series called Jacked Up. Jacked Up. And this is a series about how God uses imperfect people to accomplish his great work here on this earth. Anybody here a little bit, a little bit messed up, maybe a little bit tweaked from time to time? Okay. Anybody here just perfect? You just got it all figured out? So some of you are like, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty close, pretty close. Um, you know, I, I, if we're honest with ourselves, we know. 
We know that we've, we've messed up, that, that, that we have issues in our life. And throughout this series, we're taking a look at different people in the Bible who have had issues, who have been messed up, and who have made mistakes, but yet God still used them. We talk about Moses and how he was a murderer, and God still used him to deliver his people. We talk about Jonah and how Jonah ran the other way when God called him to do something, and God still used him in a miraculous way. For many times, though, for many people, we we get this idea that when God uses us, it's like there's this clearly defined before and after picture, right? You you see these pictures that that people will post online, perhaps, of of a weight loss journey or physical fitness journey or something like that. They they have a before and an after, right? And and sometimes we get this idea that, that like, oh, you're, you're all messed up and then God fixes you, and then you're perfect. Everything is, is perfect and shiny and new and perfect. And, and honestly, that's not usually what happens. We, we're kind of this, this crooked path sometimes of, of doing things messed up and then getting some things right and God using us, and then we kind of stray and, and wander again. And this is kind of a, a story like that. The story is a reminder, though, that God can use any of us. No matter how flawed, how messed up, how jacked up you are, he can use any of us to accomplish his will here on this earth. So this is about a man named Gideon. And and, and Gideon started with fear, but he ends up a mighty warrior in this story. Perhaps you've heard this story before. But Gideon was an Israelite. He was, he was a Jew, and, and the Israelites were under uh, attack by the Midianites. The Midianites, Midianites were, were their enemies. They were attacked. They were being uh, attacked for basically seven years they were at war, and they were just getting brutally conquered. In fact, the Bible says that God turned the Israelites over to the Midianites for these seven years, and the Midianites were brutal. In fact, so much so that when they would come through, all of the Jews would go and they would hide. They would hide in caves. They would hide in the, in the woods. They would hide anywhere they could so that way they would not be in the path. And, and as the Midianites would come through, they would just decimate and destroy everything. The, the Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites, they would plant uh, gardens and farms and, and, and they would raise livestock and they would do all of these things. But then at harvest time, the, these Midianites would come through on their donkeys and with their livestock and with their, with their, with their camels and come through with all this stuff and they would just eat everything. They would just destroy it and they would take all of the harvest. They'd strip the land bare. The Bible says they would come in like, like, like locusts and they would just destroy and take everything. And as a result, God's chosen people, the Jews, they were in hiding and they were also starving. They're starving to death. They're hiding And this is where we find Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verse 11. It says, then the angel of the Lord came. Now, now we, we've talked about the angel of the Lord in the first part of the series. And, and whenever we see the angel of the Lord written in this way in the Old Testament, now keep in mind, this is the Old Testament. This is the first part of the Bible before Jesus was born, before he was born and died on the cross and all that. But when you see angel of the Lord, most theologians agree this is actually Jesus appearing in the Old Testament before he was born, because Jesus was God all along, and he's appearing in this angelic form, in this, this bodily form, to these people. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah. This is not Oprah, okay? This is Ophrah, which belongs to Joash of the clan of Ebezer. Now, Gideon, son of Joash, so, so this tree belongs to his dad, okay? So he's sitting there beneath the tree. Gideon, the son of Joash, was, he's doing something kind of odd here, right? He was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press. Now, do you know what wine presses are used for? You guys don't know? Let me tell, for making wine, right? Man, this is not a trick question here, okay? So, Wine presses are for making wine, not for threshing grain. Generally, when you thresh grain, you'd go on top of a hill where it's windy. They, they, would, they would beat the grain so it would separate, and then they would throw it in the air, and the wind would blow the chaff away, and they'd be left with the grain that they could use. But now, that's not where Gideon is. He's in a, what? Wine press. Well, you, are you guys okay? Or, he was in a wine press, okay? And that's what they use for making wine. Okay, okay, you guys are with me. Okay, great, great. Just want to make sure you're awake here. So he's in a wine press. Now, 
as you can imagine, there's not much wind in the bottom of a wine press. When, when you're trying, to, when you're trying to, to, to thresh this grain, this is not the ideal place to be doing it. Why is he there, though? It says, Joash was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. He had a little bit of grain. It was all that him and his family probably had to eat. And he's there threshing it, and he's hiding in a wine press, you know, dug b- below the surface of the ground, and he's threshing this grain. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Wait, what is he doing? He's threshing grain in a wine press because he's afraid. And here the angel of the Lord is saying, Hey, mighty hero. Like, I don't know. I can't understand the tone here. I don't know if this is sarcasm. I don't know what's going on here. But he's like, hey, mighty hero. Gideon's probably like, excuse me, could you keep your voice down? You, you, ever, you ever hiding on somebody? You're hiding or, or you don't want somebody to see you and you're hiding and somebody else comes up and starts talking to you. And it's like, it's like hold on, could you just keep your voice down? I don't want anybody to know that I'm here right now. And that's where Gideon is. He's hiding. It's kind of funny. He's not being heroic. He's scared here. And he's in the wine press. He's in the pits. You ever find yourself in the pits? Ever find yourself hiding in the pits? You don't want to be found. You're you're down. You're low. And and it's like, man, I just don't want any attention being brought to myself right now. Imagine being called a hero when you're hiding for your life. But it's interesting that this is how God sees him. And this is how God sees you and how God sees me. See, God sees us in a a different way. He sees us not as we are, but he sees us as who we could become. He sees us as who he has created us to be. He sees sees what he's put inside of us. In your notes, if you're taking them, God sees potential when all we see are problems. Anybody got any problems in your life? Like, okay, a couple of you do. The rest of you, smooth sailing. That's great. Teach us how you do it, okay? But here's the thing. A, A lot of us, we have problems in our life. We're going through difficulties. We're going through hardships. We're going through adversities. And all we can see is the problem. And God sees potential. And he's like, hey, you mighty hero. God is with you. Continuing in verse 13. Sir, sir, Gideon replied. And he kind of gets a little salty here, honestly. He says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where's all the miracles? Our ancestors told us about. Where's all these miracles? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us. Have you ever felt like God has abandoned you? That maybe the situation that you're in is too difficult for God to move in? Maybe you feel like the the problem that you're facing is too big for God, that God is not interested, God does not care about the adversity that you face. He says the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have. Underline that. He said, go with the strength you have. That you have. How often in our life do we think we need to go with something else, right? Uh, I got to go with the strength that somebody else has. I got to go with the knowledge that I'm going to get in the future. I got to go with the skill, the experience that I'm going to have later on down the line. I got to go with the money that I'm going to have some point in time in the future. That's not what the angel of the Lord says. He says, go with the strength that you have. He's like, I don't have much. Don't you see where I am? I'm in a wine press threshing grain. This is absurd. He says, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites because I am sending you. Gideon just makes excuses. He starts making these excuses. He says, well, I can't do it because I'm from the weakest clan in Manasseh. And and I'm not only from the weakest clan, but I'm the weakest, least person in my family. He's like, I'm the most unlikely person you could pick. Here I am. I'm hiding for my life, trying to scrape by a little bit of food for my family. And you're calling me? And he says, go with the strength that you have. Are you facing difficulties in your life right now? Perhaps God is telling you to go with the strength that you have. Are you waiting for God to move in a supernatural way and wondering why he's not moving as fast as you'd like him to? Go with the strength that you have. Maybe you're facing financial difficulties. Go with the strength that you have. Maybe you're having some problems at at, at work or at school. Go with the strength that you have. Maybe you're facing sickness and illness. Go with the strength that you have. And here Gideon is questioning God and questioning his presence and his power, much like we do when we face problems. God, where are you now? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? God, you've abandoned me. 
God, I thought you did, did miracles. I thought you moved in miraculous ways. Well, where are you now? And he says, just go with the strength that you have. Go with the strength that you have. Are we questioning God in the situations of our life? See, Gideon, all throughout this story that we read, if you read the whole story of Gideon, you see that he never quite fully trusted in God. It seems like every step of the way, he wants God to prove himself. He's like, I want you to prove it. And so, so he goes and he lights this food on fire. He says, I want you to prove it again. And he, he has this fleece that he puts out and it turns wet and it turns dry and like all this stuff. And then there's another time. He's like, oh, I want you to prove it. Like, he just keeps asking for God to prove himself. He doesn't fully trust him. Every time God asks him to do something, he's like, I'm going to need some evidence first before I'm willing to obey you. See, he, he was... He was lacking in a few areas. But see, here's the good thing. Good thing for people like us, right? And you know, it's that God doesn't wait for us to be perfect to call us. God doesn't wait for us to be perfect. He doesn't wait for you to have it all figured out. He doesn't wait for you to get your act all together before he calls us, before he begins to use us. He meets us in the imperfections and he calls us and he asks us to step out in faith. This does not mean that we should stay where we were, but when he calls us, we're not perfect. We're jacked up, we're messed up, and he's calling us, he's inviting us to take a step out of our past, out of our baggage, and into the life that he has prepared for us. So like Gideon, we may feel inadequate. You may feel like you're not good enough to accomplish what God wants you to do. You're not skilled enough, you're not smart enough, you're not wealthy enough to do what God has want, wants you to do. But see, God sees our potential and he equips us for his purpose. He sees the potential and he equips us to accomplish his purpose for our lives. So he says to Gideon, here's your first task, your first assignment, your first mission, should you choose to accept it. He says, I want you to go up on this mountain near your dad's house and he's got an altar there to the false god Baal, and I want you to tear it down. Just rip it down. So it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but if you think about it, like this is a big deal. Like he's going to his dad's uh, up there. There's an idol where people come all over, and, and, and they worship these false gods, and, and God said, I want you to go there, and I want you to tear it down. Not only do I want you to tear it down, but I want you to take, he says, I want you to take the second bull that your dad owns, it's the seven-year-old one, and I want you to sacrifice it on the altar, signifying that it's mine. And I'm like, why, why the second bull? Why the seven-year-old one? And I don't fully know why, but I think that sometimes these things are put there for a reason, and I, the only other time we see seven years mentioned in this chapter is when it says that the Midianites were captured Israel for this period of seven years, and it's like this is symbolic, saying, hey, that the year that that bull was born, this is the entire lifespan, and we're going to put an end to it right now. We're putting an end to the bull, but we're also putting an end to this captivity, this, this war that you're facing. We're going to come, and we're going to set things free. And so, so Gideon is nervous, and he grabs 10 other guys. He says, hey, guys, if I'm dying, you're dying with me. Like, we're doing this together. And, and guess what he decides? He decides he's going to He's going to do it at night. Look at this. It says Judge, Judges 6, 27. So Gideon took 10 of his servants, because he's like, we're in this together, guys. And he did as the Lord has commanded, but he did it at, his night, at night because he was afraid. I don't know if you've ever done anything exciting at nighttime before. Maybe go on a hike. A couple weeks ago, uh, my, my middle daughter, uh, Macy, and I, she's been asking me for a while. She's like, I want to go on a night hike. I want to go on a night hike. I want to go on a night hike. So I'm like, okay, fine. So we woke up at like 1 a.m. and we went and we hiked up to the top of a mountain and just had a blast there. But I'm thinking like, like imagine being in this situation where you're going to go up to the top of a mountain, you're going to rip down something. And then the next morning when everybody wakes up and sees this, they're going to be wondering what happened, wondering what happened. And that's what Gideon did. They went up and they tore it down. And, and, and sure, people were angry and, and some stuff happened, but, but God moved in a supernatural way. And even in fear, Gideon obeyed. And this was the beginning of the transformation in his life. Taking the first step of faith, even if, you're, even if your knees are shaking, even if you don't want to take that step, even if you're afraid of what the outcome may be, Gideon took the step. And Gideon's obedience even in the middle of fear, shows that, see, courage, in your notes, courage isn't the absence of fear, but it's the willingness to act despite it. 
That, that being cur- courageous doesn't mean you don't have any fear. It doesn't mean you're, you're not afraid of something. Because surely Gideon was afraid. He's like, we're doing this together and we're doing it in the middle of the night where nobody can see us, but he still went and did it. And it's easy for us to kind of pick on the fact that he did it in the middle of the night. And it's easy for us to pick on the fact that he took all these guys with him to do it as accomplices. But, but ultimately, the most important thing is that he did it. And then after he did it, he rallied the troops of Israel together and said, we are going to go to war. We are going to break free from this tyranny of the Midianites. We are going to war. And he rallies all the fighting people, all the fighting men together, and they, they get their army together, and there's, there's 32,000 of them. The only problem is this. There's 135,000 of their enemies. This means they're outnumbered, greatly outnumbered. It's basically a one-to-four ratio that that every uh, Jew would have to kill four Midianites in order for them to win this battle. And then God says, you know what? I think you've got too many people in your army. So I want you to go out there and say, hey, if anybody's kind of not feeling well, if you're a little afraid, whatever it may be, you're welcome to go home. Gideon's like, excuse me, we're already outnumbered. God says, do it. And he does it. Anybody want to go home? Any chickens out here? Anybody? Any losers want to go home? And they're like, okay. 22,000 of them went home. Left with 10,000 soldiers. Gideon's like, what are we doing now? Like the, rate, like the odds are just so far stacked against them. God says, you know what? This is still not good. Gideon's like, yeah, you're telling me it's not good. God's like, no, you got too many still. So I want you to bring them to the water, and I want you to encourage them all to drink. And, and those who, who, who just like drink right, right, right straight out of the, the, the river, I want you to send them home. But if they scoop it up with their hands, then you can keep them. I'm like, what difference does it make? But this is what God said. And the ones that scooped the water out, there was only 300 of them. And he sent everybody else home. So now he's got an army of only 300 people. Gideon's like, we have a problem here. But look what Gideon, uh, what God told Gideon, Judges 7, 7. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. We're not going to need them. See, God reduces the army. Why do you think he did that? So there's going to be no doubt who the victory belongs to. There's no doubt. When they win this battle, there's no doubt. It was not Gideon's leadership that accomplished this. It was not the 300 men that accomplished this. They're down to to 300. That means it's it's 1 to 450 right now. Every Jew would have to kill 450 Midianites in order to win this battle. The odds are stacked against them. And sometimes, though, in our life, God begins to cut things down to show us that it's not by our might and it's not by our power, but it's by the Spirit, says the Lord. It's not by our strength. And and we look around and say, God, why why are you cutting these things down? Why are you you trimming these things? Why are you pruning? Why are you cutting these things away? And it's because he wants to move. See, his strategies are different than ours. In your notes, God's strategies often defy human logic. See, his ways are not our ways. He thinks in ways that are different than us. So God gave Gideon a unique battle plan. And it involved trumpets and jars and torches. And and he gave all of them these these jars and and a torch. He said, I want you to put the the torch in the jar and you're going to go stand up on the the surrounding mountains and you're going to take the trumpet. And when I give the call, we're going to blow the trumpets in the middle of the night and we're going to smash the jars and there's going to be fire and there's going to be trumpets and it's going to be a massacre. And and they're like, okay, whatever you say, Gideon. They went up and they did it. And, And when they did it, The Midianites were so confused, they turned on each other and wiped out themselves. I mean, it's just crazy. They just destroyed themselves. And then, and just Josh, uh, you know, Gideon and all the men, men that are just surrounded up there, like, okay, well, I guess we won at this point. See, God did something amazing. When we trust God and we follow his plan, sometimes his plan is unconventional. He'll do the impossible through us. But see, it's not when we take control. When we take control, we end up getting more jacked up than we were before. When we take control, we end up messing things up because because we're relying on our own strength rather than the strength of the Holy Spirit. See, what are we relying on? On our strengths, on our abilities, on our wisdom, on our money, on on our abilities, or are we relying on Christ? And you know, it's our limitations, our opportunities for God to show his strength. 
See, we don't like our limitations. We don't like our weaknesses. And yet here we see a situation where God was deliberately weakening the army so that he could show his strength. And perhaps God wants to show his strength in your life and in your situation and in the things that you're facing. And we see Gideon, he goes from coward to conqueror. And Gideon's 300 men armed with these trumpets and these jars and these torches and they defeated the Midianites. But the victory was undeniably God's and not theirs. The story shows how God will use imperfect people to do his work, to do his plan, And despite his doubts and despite fears and insecurities and inadequacies, God called him and strengthened him and ultimately led them to victory. And no matter your past, no matter your weaknesses, no matter your fears, God can use you too. Even if you find yourself in the bottom of the pits, God still is offering to use you to work through you. And this is an amazing thing. It's a story of someone who is jacked up and how God used him to accomplish great things. The thing of it is, is Gideon was a jacked up guy. Like not just, like he, he kept doing things that were jacked up even later on. He did things jacked up a- after the victory. Usually when we talk about the story, we, we just like to end it right there because it's exciting, right? We're like, wow, God used... After that, he, he goes, and, and everybody's like, we want to make you the king. We want to make you the king. And he's like, nah, I don't want to be the king. He's like, but what you can do is everybody who went into the Midianite camp and you collected all the spoils of war, he's like, I want everybody to give me an earring. Like, it's kind of a weird gift, but he's like, like give me an earring. So they give him all these earrings, and it's 43 pounds of gold. And he takes this gold, and he makes uh, the, 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 this, this kind of religious relic. They called it an ephod. He makes this thing for him and his family, but it ends up being like another false god for them. And it shows that even these great leaders are still making some mistakes. It reminds us that, that, that our journey with God is still ongoing. We need to stay humble. We need to stay vigilant. He must be like, look, look, look at all these great things that I've done. We've just conquered the enemy, and so I'm going to make this thing. Look what it says in Judges 8.27. It says, Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Ophrah, his hometown. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. It's like right back in it, right back in it. See, this is the thing, too, is that sometimes, even though God uses us, it doesn't mean that we've got it all figured out yet. It doesn't mean that we can, we can just, just, you know, uh, relax and just take it easy. Oh, I don't need to move forward anymore. See, Gideon got a little complacent here. He got a little comfortable. He says, oh, I'm just going to go back to doing things the way we used to do them, and it ends up falling into a new trap. The reality, though, is this, is that even when we stumble, God's grace is sufficient. And we need to learn from our mistakes. And we need to continue to seek God's guidance each and every day. And maybe God moves in a miraculous way in your life. And and it's easy for us to get complacent after that. No, keep following Jesus as closely as before. And maybe you don't see him moving in a miraculous way. We keep following him and, and, and moving with him as closely as we can. See, Gideon reminds us that God uses the imperfect people. And that our mistakes don't disqualify us from being used by him. Yes. He wants us to change and be transformed, but he invites us to come as we are. This is in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21. It says, may he equip you. May God equip you with all you need for doing his will. God will equip you if you're willing. See, Gideon had a choice to be made. He could have stayed in the wine press. He could have stayed... Just in fear, he could have stayed in hiding, but he chose to take a stand and be used by God. He says, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he, may he produce in you, this is not you producing, this is God producing. May he produce in you through the power, not of yourself, but the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. See, this is the work of God producing in us, building in us, growing in us, bringing transformation in our lives. And as a result, we can see the supernatural because in your notes, God specializes in beating the odds every time. See, with God on your side, nothing can stand against you. When God is on your side, the odds are always stacked in your favor. 
then maybe it's time for, for you to get up out of that pit, out of that wine press of fear, the pit of despair, the pit of depression, the pit of anger, the pit of shame. Maybe it's time for us to take a step out and allow God to use us. See, God has got your back. If you just look around here, look at our church. We're not the most skilled We're not the most qualified, not the most attractive. I'm certainly not. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing half of the time, but God knows, and he uses us to do his extraordinary work here on this earth if we are available and willing for him to work in us and through us. And he's bringing us on a journey, and he's continuing that. See, God is looking for men and women, for boys and girls who are like Gideon, people who are perhaps hidden and broken, but they're willing to take a stand when they realize that God has got their back. And then they're willing to charge into battle with just a trumpet and letting their light shine for the world to see. And if you feel weak and if you feel foolish, maybe you feel unqualified or broken, maybe you feel shamed, maybe you feel damaged, that's okay because you are who God is looking for. Don't get me wrong, he doesn't want to leave you that way. He wants to restore you into usefulness so that you can help to advance his kingdom here on this earth. God uses the broken, the messed up, the damaged. And God can take us from our lowest point and raise us up for his glory and for his honor. And now even though Gideon makes mistakes along the way, God still used him mightily. And we see in Hebrews, when it talks about the hall of faith, the people in the Bible who had the greatest faith, his name is mentioned. Because he took a step even though he was unqualified. See, God loves to use the weak. God loves to use the ordinary. God loves to use the plain and the normal. And you may feel like there is too much at stake. There's too much to face. But God is the game changer. And if he is on your side, then nothing can stand against you. Let's pray. Well, God, we come to you now. And we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you that you have chosen to use the imperfect people. That you've chosen to use people like like Gideon, who was afraid and made excuses and doubted. And you used him for your glory. And because you used him, that gives us some hope that maybe you can use us. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, don't let another day go by. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. It says in Scripture that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. And so if that's where you are right now, why don't you take that step? It's a step of faith. Take the step, call on his name. Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. God, please increase the faith in our lives now. We want to be great in your kingdom. We want to be people who make a difference for you. So please use us. Use us even with our brokenness, even with our shame, even with our past, even with our mistakes, even as jacked up as we may be, Lord, we invite you to use us for your glory, your honor. We put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. And we say, have your way in us. Have your way through us. We thank you for using the normal people, the plain people, the messed up, the unqualified and the broken for your glory. We say, here we are. Use us. Have your way in Jesus' name.
It's cool to see how God worked through Gideon despite his fear and despite his doubt. And just reflecting on that, have you ever realized that it's those moments in life when we do the scary thing, we do the hard thing, we do the thing that seems like it's, it's too much for us. And I think about uh, one of the, the scariest and happiest days of my life. Uh, my wife and I are going to be celebrating our 10-year anniversary this month. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And... Uh, I just remember how hard my heart was pounding that day that I decided to ask her. And it was weird because we had had conversations, we had discussed it, we were both on the same page, it wasn't like a surprise engagement, any of that stuff, it was still so nerve wracking. Because deep down I knew that I wasn't good enough, that I had flaws, that I was imperfect, and that if I were being honest and impartial, I probably wouldn't have been the guy that I selected to be with my wife. But God can use that if we're willing. That despite our imperfections, despite our shortcomings, despite whatever we see in ourselves that isn't good enough or isn't great enough, God can use it to make you whatever he needs you to be for that circumstance and that situation. So every day I have to pray to God, make me a good husband, make me a good spouse, work through my flaws, work through my shortcomings, because I know on my own I can't do that. So I want to encourage you to do the hard things, to do the scary things, but don't do it alone. Ask God to be there alongside of you, to work through you, and to use you. With that, have a great week. Thanks, guys, so much.